Chapter Fourteen of the Mysteries of Paris, Volume Four by Eugène Sue. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recollections. Jacques Ferrand had quickly and readily obtained the liberty of Fleur de Marie, which indeed only required a simple official order. Instructed by the Chouette of La Goualeuse being at Saint Lazare he had immediately applied to one of his clients an honourable and influential man saying that a young female who had once erred but afterwards sincerely repented being now confined in st lazare was in danger of forgetting her good resolutions in consequence of her association with the other prisoners this young girl having been added the notary strongly recommended to him by persons of high respectability who wanted to take care of her when she quitted the prison he besought his client in the name of religion virtue and the future return to goodness of a poor girl to interest himself in obtaining her liberation and further to screen himself from all chance of future consequences the notary most earnestly charged his client not to allow his name to transpire in the business on any account as he was desirous of avoiding any mention of having been employed in the furtherance of so good and charitable a work this request which was attributed to the unassuming modesty and benevolence of jacques ferrand a man equally esteemed for his piety as for honour and probity was strictly complied with the liberation of fleur de marie being asked and obtained in the client's name alone and by way of evincing a still greater regard for the shrinking delicacy of the notary's nature the order for quitting the prison was sent under cover to jacques ferrand that he might send it on to the parties interesting themselves for the young girl and when madame seraphin presented the order to the directors of the prison she stated herself to have been sent by the parties feeling a desire to save the young person it referred to from the favourable manner in which the matron of the prison had spoken to madame d'harville fleur de marie not a doubt existed as to its being to that lady la goualeuse was indebted for her return to freedom there was therefore no chance of the appearance of madame seraphin exciting any mistrust in the mind of her victim madame seraphin could so well assume the look and manner of what is commonly styled a nice motherly kind of person that it required a more than ordinary share of penetration to discover a strong proportion of falsehood deceit and cunning behind the smooth glance or the hypocritical smile but in spite of the hardened villainy with which she had shared so long and deeply in the nefarious practices of her employer madame seraphin old and hackneyed as she was could not view without emotion the exquisite loveliness of the being her own hand had surrendered even as a child to the cruel care of the chouette and whom she was now leading to an inevitable death well my dear cried madame seraphin speaking in a tone of honeyed sweetness as fleur de marie drew near i suppose you are very glad to get away from prison oh yes indeed ma'am i presume it is madame d'harville who has had the goodness to obtain my liberty for me you are not mistaken in your guess but come we are already a little behindhand and we have still some distance to go we are going to madame georges at the farm at bouqueval are we not madame cried la goualeuse oh yes certainly by all means answered the femme de charge in order to avert all suspicion from the mind of her victim yes my dear we are going into the country as you say and then added with a sort of good-humoured teasing but that is not all before you see madame georges a little surprise awaits you come come our coach is waiting below and how you will be astonished by and by come then let us go your most obedient servant gentlemen and with a multitude of bows and salutations from madame seraphin to the registrar his clerk and all the various members of the establishment then and there assembled she descended the stairs with la goualeuse followed by an officer to command the opening of the gates through which they had to pass the last had just closed behind them and the two females found themselves beneath the vast porch which looks out upon the street of the faubourg st denis when they nearly ran against a young female who appeared hurrying towards the prison as though full of anxiety to visit one of its inmates it was rigolette as pretty and light-footed as ever her charming face set off by a simple yet becoming cap tastefully ornamented with a cherry-coloured riband while her dark brown hair was laid in bright glossy bands down each clear and finely rounded cheek she was wrapped in a plaid shawl over which fell a snowy muslin collar secured by a small knot of riband on her arm she carried a straw basket while thanks to her light careful way of picking her steps her thick-soled boots were scarcely soiled and yet the poor girl had walked far that day Rigolette! exclaimed fleur de marie 
as she recognized her old prison companion and the sharer in her rural excursions note seven the reader will perhaps recollect that in the recital made by la goualeuse to rodolph at their first meeting at the ogress's of the early events of her life she spoke to him of rigolette who a friendless child like herself had been with her confined in a maison de détention until she had reached the age of sixteen la goualeuse returned the grisette and with one accord the two girls threw themselves into each other's arms nothing more touchingly beautiful could be imagined than the contrast between these two young creatures both so lovely though differing so entirely from one another in appearance the one exquisitely fair with large melancholy blue eyes and an outline of feature of faultless purity the pale pensive intellectual cast of the whole countenance reminding the observer of one of those sweet designs of a village made by greuze the same clear delicacy of complexion the same ineffable mixture of graceful pensiveness and candid innocence the other a sparkling brunette with round rosy cheeks and bright black eyes set off by a laughing dimpled face and mirthful air the very impersonation of youthful gaiety and light-heartedness the rare and touching specimen of happy poverty of contented labour and honest industry after the first burst of their affectionate greetings had passed away the two girls regarded each other with close and tender scrutiny the features of rigolette were radiant with the joy she experienced at this unexpected meeting fleur de marie on the contrary felt humbled and confused at the sight of her early friend which recalled but too vividly to her mind the few days of peaceful calm she had known previous to her first degradation dear dear goualeuse exclaimed the grisette fixing her bright eyes with intense delight on her companion to think of meeting you at last after so long an absence it is indeed a delightful surprise replied fleur de marie it is so very long since we have seen each other ah but now said rigolette for the first time remarking the rustic habilement of la goualeuse i can account for seeing nothing of you during the last six months you live in the country i see yes answered fleur de marie casting down her eyes i have done so for some time past and i suppose that like me you have come to see some friend in this prison yes stammered poor fleur de marie blushing up to her eyes with shame and confusion i was going i mean i have just been seeing some one and of course am now returning home you live a good way out of paris i dare say ah you dear kind girl it is just like you to come all this distance to perform a good action do you remember the poor lying in woman to whom you gave not only your mattress with the necessary baby clothes but even what money you had left and which you meant to have spent in a country excursion for you were then crazy for the country my pretty village maid and you who cared nothing about it how very good-natured and obliging of you to go thither merely for the sake of pleasing me well but i pleased myself at the same time why you who were always inclined to be grave and serious when once you got among the fields or found yourself in the thick shade of a wood oh then what a wild overjoyed little madcap you became nobody would have fancied it in the same person flying after butterflies crowding your hands and apron with more flowers than either could hold it made me quite delighted to see you it was quite treat enough for a week to recollect all your happiness and enjoyment but do let me have another look at you how sweetly pretty you look in that nice little round cap yes decidedly you were cut out to be a country girl just as much as i was to be a paris grisette well i hope you are happy since you have got the sort of line you prefer and certainly after all i cannot say i was so very much astonished at your never coming near me oh said i that dear goualeuse is not suited for paris she is a true wild flower as the song says and the air of great cities is not for them so said i my pretty dear goualeuse has found a place in some good honest family who live in the country and i was right was i not dear yes said fleur de marie nearly sinking with confusion quite right there is only one thing i have to reproach you for reproach me inquired fleur de marie looking tearfully at her companion yes you ought to have let me know before you went you should have said good-bye if you were only leaving me at night to return in the morning or at any rate you should have sent me word how you were going on i-i quitted paris so suddenly 
stammered out fleur de marie becoming momentarily more and more embarrassed that indeed i was not able oh i'm not at all angry i don't speak of it to scold you i am far too happy in meeting you unexpectedly and besides i commend you for getting out of such a dangerous place as paris where it is so difficult to earn a quiet livelihood for you know two poor friendless girls like you and me might be led into mischief without thinking of or intending any harm when there is no person to advise it leaves one so very defenceless and then come a parcel of deceitful flattering men with their false promises when perhaps want and misery are staring you in the face there for instance do you recollect that pretty girl called julie and rosine who had such a beautiful fair skin and such coal-black eyes oh yes i recollect them very well then my dear goualeuse you will be extremely sorry to hear that they were both led astray seduced and deserted till at last from one unfortunate step to another they have become like the miserable creatures confined in this prison merciful heaven exclaimed fleur de marie hanging down her head and blushing the deep blush of shame rigolette misinterpreting the real cause of her friend's exclamation continued i admit that their conduct is wrong nay wicked but then you know my dear goualeuse because you and i have been so fortunate as to preserve ourselves from harm you because you have been living with good and virtuous people in the country out of the reach of temptation and i because i had no time to waste in listening to a set of make-believe lovers and also because i found greater pleasure in having a few birds and in trying to get things a little comfortable and snug around me i say it is not for you and me to be too severe with others and god alone knows whether opportunity deceit and destitution may not have had as much to do in causing the misery and disgrace of julie and rosine and who can say whether in their place we might not have acted as they have done alas cried fleur de marie i accuse them not on the contrary i pity them from my heart come come my dear child interrupted madame Seraphin, impatiently offering her arm to her victim you forget that i said we were already behind our time pray madame grant us a little more time said rigolette it is so very long since i saw my dear goualeuse i should be glad to do so replied madame Seraphin, much annoyed at this meeting between the two friends but it is now three o'clock and we have a long way to go however i will manage to allow you ten minutes longer gossip so pray make the best of your time and tell me i pray of yourself said fleur de marie affectionately pressing the hands of rigolette between her own are you still the same merry light-hearted and happy creature i always knew you i was happy and gay enough a few days ago but now you sorrowful i can hardly believe it ah oh, but indeed i am not that i am at all changed from what you always found me a regular roger bontemps one to whom nothing was a trouble but then you see everybody is not like me so that when i see those i love unhappy why naturally that makes me unhappy too still the same kind warm-hearted girl why who could help being grieved as i am just imagine my having come hither to visit a poor young creature a sort of neighbouring lodger in the house where i live as meek and mild as a lamb she was poor thing well she has been most shamefully and unjustly accused that she has never mind of what just now her name is louise morel she is the daughter of an honest and deserving man a lapidary who has gone mad in consequence of her being put in prison at the name of louise morel one of the victims of the notary's villainy madame seraphin started and gazed earnestly at rigolette the features of the grisette were however perfectly unknown to her nevertheless from that instant the femme de charge listened with an attentive ear to the conversation of the two girls poor thing continued the goualeuse how happy it must make her to find that you have not forgotten her and her misfortunes and that is not all it really seems as though some spell hung over me but truly and positively this is the second poor prisoner i have left my home to-day to visit i have come a long way and also from a prison but that was a place of confinement for men you rigolette in a prison for men yes i have indeed i have a very dejected customer there i can assure you there you see my basket 
it is divided in two parts and each of my poor friends has an equal share in its contents i have got some clean things here for poor louise and i have left a similar packet with germain that is the name of my other poor captive i cannot help feeling ready to cry when i think of our last interview i know it will do no good but still for all that the tears will come into my eyes but what is it that distresses you so much why because you see poor germain frets so much at being mixed up in his prison with the many bad characters that are there that it has quite broken his spirits he seems to have no taste no relish for anything has quite lost his appetite and is wasting away daily so when i perceived the change i said to myself oh poor fellow i see he eats nothing i must make him something nice and delicate to tempt his appetite a little he shall have one of those little dainties he used to be so fond of when he and i were next room neighbours when i say dainties of course i don't mean such as rich people expect by that name no no my dish was merely some beautiful mealy potatoes mashed with a little milk and sugar well my dear goualeuse i prepared this for him put it in a nice little china basin and took it to him in his prison telling him i had brought him a little tidbit he used once to be fond of and which i hoped he would like as well as in former days i told him i had prepared it entirely myself hoping to make him relish it but alas no what do you think oh what why instead of increasing his appetite i only set him crying for when i displayed my poor attempts at cookery he seemed to take no notice of anything but the basin out of which he had been accustomed to see me take my milk when we supped together and then he burst into tears and by way of making matters still better i began to cry too although i tried all i could to restrain myself you see how everything went against me i had gone with the intention of enlivening his spirits and instead of that there i was making him more melancholy than ever still the tears he shed were no doubt sweet and consoling tears oh never mind what sort of tears they were that was not the way i meant to have consoled him but la all this while i am talking to you of germain as if you knew him he is an old acquaintance of mine one of the best young men in the world as timid and gentle as any young girl could be and whom i loved as a friend and a brother oh then of course his troubles became yours also to be sure but just let me show you what a good heart he must have when i was coming away i asked him as usual what orders he had for me saying jokingly by way of making him smile that i was his little housekeeper and that i should be very punctual and exact in fulfilling whatever commissions he gave me in order to remain in his employ so then he trying to smile in his turn asked me to bring him one of walter scott's romances which he had formerly read to me while i worked that romance was called ivan ivanhoe that's it i was so much amused with this book that germain read it twice over to me poor germain how very very kind and attentive he was i suppose he wished to keep it as a reminiscence of bygone days no doubt of it for he bade me to go to the library from whence we had had it and to purchase the very same volumes that had so much entertained us and which we had read together not merely to hire them yes positively to buy them out and out and you may imagine that was something of a sacrifice for him for he is no richer than you or i he must have a noble and excellent heart to have thought of it said the goualeuse deeply touched i declare you are as much affected by it as i was my dear kind goualeuse but then you see the more i felt ready to cry the more i tried to laugh for to shed tears twice during a visit intended to be so very cheering and enlivening as mine was was rather too bad so to drive all those thoughts out of my head i began to remind him of the amusing story of a jew a person we read about in the romance i was telling you of but the more i rattled away and the greater nonsense i tried to talk the faster the large round tears gathered in his eyes and he kept looking at me with such an expression of misery as quite broke my heart and so and so at last my voice quite failed me and i could do nothing but mingle my sobs with his he had not regained his composure when i left him and i felt quite provoked with myself for my folly if that is the way said i that i comfort and cheer up poor germain i think i had better stay away 
really when i remember all the fine things i intended to have said and done by way of keeping up his spirits i feel quite spiteful towards myself for having so completely failed at the name of germain another victim of the notary's unprincipled persecution madame seraphin redoubled her before close attention and what has this poor young man done to deserve being put in prison inquired fleur de marie what has he done exclaimed rigolette whose grief became swallowed up in indignation why he has had the misfortune to fall into the hands of a wicked old notary the same as persecutes poor louise of her whom you have come to see to be sure she lived as a servant with this notary and germain was also with him as a cashier it is too long a story to tell you now how or of what he unjustly accuses the poor fellow but one thing is quite certain and that is that the wretch of a notary pursues these two unfortunate beings who have never done him the least harm with the most determined malice and hatred however never mind a little patience every one in their turn that's all rigolette uttered these last words with a peculiarity of manner and expression that created considerable uneasiness in the mind of madame seraphin instead therefore of preserving the distance she had hitherto observed she at once joined in the conversation saying to fleur de marie with a kind of maternal air my dear girl it is really growing too late for us to wait any longer we must go we are waited for i assure you with much anxiety i am sorry to hurry you away because i can well imagine how much you must be interested in what your friend is relating for even i who know nothing of the two young persons she refers to cannot help feeling my very heartache for their undeserved sufferings is it possible there can be people in the world as wicked as the notary you were mentioning pray my dear mademoiselle what may be the name of this bad man if i may be so bold as to ask although rigolette entertained not the slightest suspicion of the sincerity of madame seraphin's affected sympathy yet recollecting how strictly rodolph had enjoined her to observe the utmost secrecy respecting the protection he bestowed on both germain and louise she regretted having been led away by her affectionate zeal for her friends to use such words patience every one has his turn his name madame is ferrand m jacques ferrand notary replied rigolette skilfully adding by way of compensation for her indiscreet warmth and it is the more wicked and shameful of him to torment louise and germain as he does because the poor things have not a friend upon earth but myself and god knows it is little i can do besides wishing them well out of their troubles dear me poor things observed madame seraphin well i am sure i hoped it was otherwise when i heard you say patience every one has their turn i supposed you reckoned for certain upon some powerful protector to defend these people against that dreadful notary alas no madame answered rigolette hoping to destroy any suspicion madame seraphin might still harbour such i am sorry to say is not the case for who would be generous and disinterested enough to take the part of two poor creatures like my unfortunate friends against a rich and powerful man like m ferrand oh there are many good and noble-minded persons capable of performing so good an action pursued fleur de marie after a moment's consideration and with ill-restrained excitement i myself know one to whom it is equally a duty and a pleasure to succour and assist all who are in need or difficulty one who is beloved and valued by all good persons as he is dreaded and hated by the bad rigolette gazed at the goualeuse with deep astonishment and was just on the point of asserting that she too alluding to rodolph knew some one capable of courageously espousing the cause of the weak against the strong but faithful to the injunctions of her neighbour as she styled the prince she contented herself with merely saying really do you indeed know anybody capable of generously coming forward in defence of poor oppressed individuals such as we have been talking of indeed i do and although i have already to solicit his goodness in favour of others also in severe trouble yet i am quite sure that did he but know of the undeserved misfortunes of louise and germain he would both rescue them from misery and punish their wicked persecutor for his goodness and justice are inexhaustible madame seraphin surveyed her victim with surprise this girl she said mentally might be even more dangerous than we thought for and even if i had been weak enough to feel inclined to pity her what i have just heard would have rendered the little accident which is to rid us of her quite inevitable then dear goualeuse since you have so valuable an acquaintance i beseech of you to recommend poor louise and germain to his notice said rigolette 
wisely considering that her two protégés would be all the better for obtaining two protectors instead of one and pray say that they do not in the least deserve their present wretched fate make yourself perfectly easy returned fleur de marie i promise to try to interest m rodolph in favour of your poor friends who did you say exclaimed rigolette m rodolph yes replied la goualeuse do you know him m rodolph again repeated rigolette perfectly bewildered is he a travelling clerk i really don't know what he is but why are you so much astonished because i know a m rodolph perhaps it is not the same well describe yours what is he like in the first place he is young so is mine with a countenance full of nobleness and goodness precisely exclaimed rigolette whose amazement increased oh it must be the very man is your m rodolph rather dark complexioned with a small moustache yes yes is he tall and thin with a beautiful figure and quite a fashionable gentlemanly sort of air wonderfully so considering he is but a clerk now then does your m rodolph answer to that description perfectly answered fleur de marie and i feel quite sure that we both mean the same the only thing that puzzles me is your fancying he is a clerk oh but i know he is he told me so himself and you know him intimately why he is my next-door neighbour m rodolph is i mean next-room neighbour because he occupies an apartment on the fourth floor next to mine he m rodolph lodges in the next room to you why yes but what do you find so astonishing in a thing as simple as that he only earns about fifteen or eighteen hundred francs a year and of course he could not afford a more expensive lodging though certainly he does not strike me as being a very careful or economical person for bless his dear heart he actually does not know the price of the clothes he wears no no it cannot be the same m rodolph i am acquainted with said fleur de marie reflecting seriously oh no quite impossible i suppose yours is a pattern of order and exactness he of whom i spoke i must tell you rigolette said fleur de marie with enthusiasm is all-powerful his name is never pronounced but with love and veneration there is something awe-inspiring in his very aspect giving one the desire to kneel in his presence and offer humble respect to his goodness and greatness and then it is no use trying the comparison any further my dear goualeuse for my m rodolph is neither powerful great nor imposing he is very good-natured and merry and all that but oh bless you as for being a person one would be likely to go on one's knees to why he is quite the reverse he cares no more for ceremony than i do and even promised me to come and help me clean my apartment and polish the floor and then instead of being awe-inspiring he settled with me to take me out of a sunday anywhere i like to go so that you see he can't be a very great person but bless you what am i thinking of it seems as if my heart were wholly engrossed by my sunday pleasures instead of recollecting these poor creatures shut up and deprived of their liberty in a prison ah poor dear louise and poor germain too until they are restored to freedom there is no happiness for me for several minutes fleur de marie remained plunged in a deep reverie she all at once recalled to her remembrance that at her first interview with rodolph at the house of the ogress his language and manners resembled those of the usual frequenters of the tapis franc was it not then possible that he might be playing the part of the travelling clerk for the sake of some scheme he had in view the difficulty consisted in finding any probable cause for such a transformation the grisette who quickly perceived the thoughtful meditation in which fleur de marie was lost said kindly never mind puzzling your poor brains on the subject my dear goualeuse we shall soon find out whether we both know the same m rodolph when you see yours speak of me to him when i see mine i will mention you by these means we shall easily discover what conclusion to come to where do you live rigolette number seventeen rue du temple come said madame seraphin who had attentively listened to all this conversation to herself that is not a bad thing to know this all-powerful and mysterious personage m rodolph who is no doubt passing himself off for a travelling clerk occupies an apartment adjoining that of this young mantua-maker who appears to me to know more than she chooses to own to and this defender of the oppressed it seems 
is lodging in the same house with morel and bradamanti well well if the grisette and the travelling clerk continue to meddle with what does not concern them i shall know where to lay my hand upon them as soon as ever i have spoken with m rodolph said the goualeuse i will write to you and give you my address where to send your answer but tell me yours over again i am afraid of forgetting it oh dear how fortunate i declare i have got one of my cards with me i remember a person i work for asked me to leave her one to give a friend who wished to employ me so i brought it out for that purpose but i will give it to you and carry her one another time and here rigolette handed to fleur de marie a small card on which was written in beautiful text hand mademoiselle rigolette dressmaker seventeen rue du temple there's a beauty continued the grisette oh isn't it nicely done better a good deal than printing ah poor dear germain wrote me a number of cards long ago oh he was so kind so attentive i don't know how it could have happened that i never found out half his good qualities till he became unfortunate and now i continually reproach myself with having learned to love him so late you love germain then oh yes that i do why you know i must have some pretext for visiting him in prison am i not an odd sort of girl said rigolette choking a rising sigh and smiling like an april shower amid the tears which glittered in her large dark eyes you are good and generous-hearted as you ever were said fleur de marie tenderly pressing her friend's hands within her own madame seraphin had evidently learned all she cared to know and feeling very little interest in any further disclosure of rigolette's love for young germain hastily approaching fleur de marie she abruptly said come my dear child do not keep me waiting another minute i beg it is very late and i shall be scolded as it is for being so much behind my time we have trifled away a good quarter of an hour and must endeavour to make up for it what a nasty cross old body that is said rigolette in a whisper to fleur de marie i don't like the looks of her at all then speaking in a louder voice she added whenever you come to paris my dear goualeuse be sure to come and see me i should be so delighted to have you all to myself for a whole day to show you my little home and my birds for i have got some such sweet pretty ones oh that is my chief indulgence and expense i will try to come and see you but certainly i will write you so good-bye my dear dear rigolette adieu oh if you only knew how happy i feel at having met with you again and i am sure so do i but i trust we shall soon see each other again and besides i am so impatient to know whether your m rodolph is the same as mine pray write to me very soon upon this subject will you promise you will indeed i will adieu dear rigolette farewell my very dear goualeuse and again the two poor girls each striving to conceal their distress at parting indulged in a long and affectionate embrace rigolette then turned away to enter the prison for the purpose of visiting louise according to the kind permission obtained for her by rodolph while fleur de marie with madame seraphin got into the coach which was waiting for them the coachman was instructed to proceed to batignolles and to stop at the barrier a cross-road of inconsiderable length conducted from this spot almost directly to the borders of the seine not far from the Ile du ravageur wholly unacquainted with the locality of paris fleur de marie was unable to detect that the vehicle did not take the road to the barrier saint denis it was only when the coach stopped at batignolles and she was requested by madame seraphin to alight that she said it seems to me madame that we are not in the road to bouqueval and how shall we be able to walk from hence to the farm all that i can tell you my dear child answered the femme de charge kindly is that i am obeying their orders given me by your benefactors and that you will pain them greatly if you keep your friends waiting oh not for worlds would i be so presuming and ungrateful as to oppose their slightest wish exclaimed poor fleur de marie with kindly warmth and i beseech you madame to pardon my seeming hesitation but since you plead the commands of my revered protectors depend upon my following you blindly and silently whatsoever you are pleased to take me only tell me is madame georges quite well oh in most excellent health and spirits and m rodolph perfectly well also then you know him but madame when i was speaking to rigolette concerning him just now you did not seem to be acquainted with him at least you did not say so because in pursuance with the directions given me i affected to be ignorant of the person you alluded to 
and did monsieur rodolph himself give you those orders why what a dear curious little thing this is said the femme de charge smilingly i must mind what i am about or with her innocent ways of putting questions she will find out all my secrets indeed madame i am ashamed of being so inquisitive but if you could only imagine how my heart beats with joy at the bare thoughts of seeing my beloved friends again you would pardon me but as we have only to walk on to the place whither you are taking me i shall soon be able to gratify my wishes without tormenting you by further inquiries to be sure you will my dear for i promise you that in a quarter of an hour we shall have reached the end of our journey the femme de charge having now left behind the last houses in the village of batignolles conducted fleur-de-marie across a grassy road bordered on each side by lofty walnut trees the day was warm and fine the sky half covered by the rich purple clouds of the setting sun which now cast its declining rays on the heights of the colombe situated on the other side of the seine as fleur-de-marie approached the banks of the river a delicate bloom tinged her pale cheeks and she seemed to breathe with delight the pure fresh air that blew from the country indeed so strongly was the look of happiness imprinted on her countenance that even madame seraphin could not avoid noticing it you seem full of joy my dear child i declare it is quite a pleasure to see you oh yes indeed i am overflowing with gratitude and eagerness at the thoughts of seeing my dear madame georges so soon and perhaps too monsieur rodolph i trust i may for besides my own happiness at beholding him i want to speak to him in favour of several poor unfortunate persons i should be so glad to recommend to his kindness and protection how then can i be sad when i have so many delightful things to look forward to oh who could be unhappy with such a prospect as mine and see too how gay and beautiful the sky is all covered with bright golden clouds and the dear soft green grass i think it seems greener than ever spite of the season and look look out there see where the river flows behind those willow trees oh how wide and sparkling it seems and when the sun shines on it it almost dazzles my eyes to gaze on it it seems like a sheet of gold ah i saw it shining in the same way in the basin of the prison a little while ago god does not forget even the poor prisoners but allows them to have a sight of his wondrous works though they are separated by high stone walls from their fellow-creatures the glorious sun shows them his golden face and sparkles and glitters upon the water there the same as in the gardens of a king added fleur-de-marie with pious gratitude then incited by a reference to her captivity still more to appreciate the charms of liberty she exclaimed with a burst of innocent delight oh pray madame do look there just in the middle of the river at that pretty little island bordered with willows and poplars and that sweet little white house almost close to the water's edge how delicious it must be to live there in the summer when all the leaves are on the trees and the birds sing so sweetly among the branches oh how quiet and cool it must be in that nice place well really now my dear said madame seraphin with a grim smile it is singular enough your being so much struck with that little isle why madame because it is there we are actually going to going to that island yes does that astonish you rather so madame but suppose you found your friends there oh what do you mean suppose i say you found all your friends had assembled there to welcome you on your release from prison should you not then be greatly surprised oh if it were but possible my dear madame georges monsieur rodolphe upon my word dear i am just like a baby in your hands and you turn and twist me just as you please it is useless for me to try to conceal anything for with your little winning ways you find out all secrets then i shall soon see them again dear madame how can i ever thank you sufficiently for your goodness to a poor girl like me feel how my heart beats it is all with joy and happiness well well my love be as wild with delight as you please but pray do not hurry on so very fast you forget you little mad thing that my old bones cannot run as fast as your nimble young feet i beg your pardon madame but i cannot help being quite impatient to arrive where we are going to be sure you cannot don't fancy i mean to blame you for it quite the contrary the road slopes a little now madame and it is rather rough too 
will you accept of my arm to assist you down i never refuse a good offer my dear for i am somewhat infirm as well as old while you are young and active then pray lean all your weight on me madame don't be afraid of tiring me many thanks my child your help was really very serviceable for the descent is so extremely rapid just here now then we are once more on smooth level ground oh madame can it indeed be true that i am about to meet my dear madame georges i can scarcely persuade myself it is a reality a little patience another quarter of an hour and then you will see whether it is true or false but what puzzles me said fleur de marie after a moment's reflection is why madame georges should have thought proper to meet me here instead of at the farm still curious my dear child still wanting to know everybody's reasons how very foolish and unreasonable i am am i not madame said fleur de marie smiling and by way of punishing you i have a great mind to tell you what the surprise is that your friends have prepared for you for me madame a surprise be quiet you little chatterbox you will make me reveal the secret in spite of myself we shall now leave madame seraphin and her victim proceeding along the road which led to the river's side while we precede them by a few minutes to the île du ravageur end of chapter fourteen read by celine major chapter fifteen of the mysteries of paris volume four by eugene sue this librivox recording is in the public domain the boats during the night the appearance of the isle inhabited by the martial family was very gloomy but by the bright light of day nothing could be more smiling than this accursed spot bordered by willows and poplars almost entirely covered with thick grass in which wound several paths of yellow sand the islet included a kitchen garden and a good number of fruit trees in the midst of the orchard was to be seen the hovel with the thatched roof into which martial had expressed his intention to retire with francois and amandine on this side the isle terminated at its point by a kind of stockade formed of large piles driven in to prevent the soil from wearing away in front of the house and almost touching the landing-place was a small arbour of green trellis-work intended to support in summer-time the creeping shoots of the young vines and hops a cradle of verdure beneath which were arranged tables for the visitors at one end of the house painted white and covered with tiles a wood-house with a loft over it formed at the angle a small wing much lower than the main body of the building almost precisely over this wing there appeared a window with the shutters covered with iron plates and strengthened without by two transverse iron bars attached to the wall by strong clamps three boats were undulating in the water fastened to posts at the landing-place seated in one of these boats nicolas was making sure that the valve he had introduced performed its part properly standing on a bench at the mouth of the arbour calabash with her hands placed over her eyes so as to shade away the sun was looking out in the direction in which madame seraphin and fleur de marie were to come to reach the isle i don't see any one yet old or young said calabash getting off the bench and speaking to nicolas it will be just as it was yesterday we may as well wait for the king of prussia if these women do not come in half an hour we can't wait any longer bras rouge's dodge is much better and he'll be waiting for us the diamond matcher is to be at his place in the champs elysees at five o'clock we ought to be there before her the chouette said so this morning you are right replied nicolas leaving the boat may thunder smite the old devil's skin who has given us all the trouble for nothing the valve works capitally it appears we shall only have one instead of two jobs besides bras rouge and barbillon will want us they can do nothing by their two selves true again for whilst the job is doing bras rouge must keep watch outside the cabaret and barbillon is not strong enough to drag the matcher into the cellar for the old will fight for it i know didn't the chouette say that for a joke she had got the schoolmaster at school in the cellar not in this one in another much deeper and which is filled with water at spring tides how the schoolmaster must rage and foam there in the cellar they're all alone and blind too that is no matter for if he saw as clear as ever he could see nothing there the cellar is as dark as an oven still when he has done singing all the songs he knows to pass away the time 
his days must hang precious heavy on his hands the chouette says that he amuses himself with rat hunting and that the cellar is full of game i say nicolas talking of certain persons who must be tired and fume and fret remarked calabash with a savage smile and pointing to the window fastened up with the iron plates there is one there who must be ready to devour his own flesh and blood bah he's asleep since the morning he hasn't stirred and his dog is silent perhaps he has strangled him for food for two days they must both be desperate hungry and thirsty up there together that is their affair martial may still last a long time in this way if it amuses him when it is done why we shall say he died of his complaint and there'll be an end of that affair do you think so of course i do as mother went to asnières this morning she met pere ferraud the fisherman and as he was very much astonished at not having seen his friend martial for the last two days mother told him that martial was confined to his bed and was so ill that his life was despaired of daddy ferraud swallowed all like so much honey he'll tell everybody else and when the thing's done and over why it'll all seem natural enough yes but he won't die directly this way is a tedious one what else is to be done there was no way of doing otherwise that devil of a martial when he's put up is as full of mischief as the old one himself and as strong as a bull particularly when he suspects anything it is dangerous to approach him but now his door is well nailed up on the outside what can he do his window is strongly fastened with iron too why he might have driven out the bars by cutting away the plaster with his knife and he would have done it only i got up the ladder and chopped at his fingers with the bill hook every time he tried to go to work what a pleasant watch said the ruffian with a chuckle it must have been vastly amusing why it was to give you time to come with the iron plates you went to get from pere micou what a rage the dear brother must have been in he ground his teeth like a lunatic two or three times he tried to drive me away from the iron bars with his stick but then as he had only one hand at liberty he could not work and release the iron bars which was what he was trying at fortunately there's no fireplace in his room and the door is solid and his hands finely cut if not he would work his way through the floor what through those heavy beams no no there's no chance of his escaping the shutters are covered with iron plates and strengthened with two bars of iron the door is nailed up outside with large boat nails three inches long his coffin is more solid than if it were made of oak and lead i say though when la louve comes out of prison and makes her way here to see her man as she calls him well we shall say look for him by the way do you know that if mother had not shut up those young rips of children they would have gnawed their ways through the door like young rats to free martial that little vagabond francois is quite furious since he suspects we have packed away his tall brother but you know they mustn't be left in the room upstairs whilst we leave the island the window is not barred and they have only to drop down outside at this moment the attention of nicolas and calabash was attracted by the sound of cries and sobs which came from the house they saw the door of the ground floor which had been open until then close violently and a minute afterwards the pale and sinister countenance of mere martial appeared through the bars of the kitchen window with her long lean arm the culprit's widow made a sign to her children to come to her there's a row i know i'll bet that it is francois who's giving himself some airs again said nicolas that beggar martial but for him this young scamp would be by himself you keep a good lookout and if you see the two women coming give me a call whilst calabash again mounted the bench and looked out for the arrival of seraphin and the goualeuse nicolas entered the house little amandine was on her knees in the centre of the kitchen sobbing and asking pardon for her brother francois enraged and threatened the lad as const in one of the angles of the apartment had nicolas hatchet in his hand and appeared determined this time to offer the most desperate resistance to his mother's wishes impassive as usual showing nicolas the cellar the widow made a sign to her son to shut francois up there i will never be shut up there cried the boy in a determined tone you want to make us die of hunger like brother martial the widow looked at nicolas with an impatient air as if to reproach him for not instantly executing her commands as with another imperious gesture she pointed to francois 
seeing his brother advance towards him the young boy brandished the axe with a desperate air and cried if you try to shut me up there whether it is mother brother or calabash so much the worse i shall strike and the hatchet cuts nicolas felt as the widow did the pressing necessity there was to prevent the two children from going to martial's succour whilst the house was left to itself as well as to put them out of the way of seeing the scenes which were about to pass for their window looked on to the river in which they were about to drown fleur de marie but nicolas was as cowardly as he was ferocious and afraid of receiving a blow from the dangerous hatchet with which his young brother was armed hesitated to approach him the widow angry at his hesitation pushed him towards francois but nicolas again retreating exclaimed but mother if he cuts me you know i want all my arms and fingers at this time and i feel still the thump that brute martial gave me the widow shrugged her shoulders and advanced towards francois don't come near me mother shrieked the boy in a fury or you'll pay dear for all the beatings you have given me in amandine let him shut us up don't strike mother cried amandine in fear at this moment nicolas saw upon a chair a large blanket which he used to wrap his booty in at times and taking hold of it and partly unfolding it he threw it completely over francois's head who in spite of his efforts finding himself entangled under its folds could not make use of his weapon nicolas then seized hold of him and with his mother's help carried him into the cellar amandine had continued kneeling in the centre of the kitchen and as soon as she saw her brother overcome she sprang up and in spite of her fright went to join him in the dark hole the door was then double locked on the brother and sister it will still be that infernal martial's fault if these children behave in this outrageous manner to us said nicolas nothing has been heard in his room since this morning said the widow with a pensive air and she shuddered nothing that's a sign mother that you were right to say to pere ferro the fisherman at asnières that martial had been so dangerously ill as to be confined to his bed for the last two days for now when all is known it will not astonish anybody after a moment's silence as and if she wished to escape a painful thought the widow replied suddenly didn't the chouette come here whilst i was at asnières yes mother why didn't she stay and accompany us to bras rouges i mistrust her bah you mistrust everybody mother you are always fancying they are going to play you some trick to-day it is the chouette yesterday it was bras rouge bras rouge is at liberty my son is at toulon yet they committed the same robbery you are always saying this bras rouge escaped because he is as cunning as a fox that's it the chouette did not stay because she had an appointment at two o'clock near the observatory with the tall man in black at whose desire she has carried off this young country girl by the help of the schoolmaster and tortillard and barbillon drove the hackney coach which the tall man in black had hired for the job so how mother do you suppose the chouette would inform against us when she tells us the jobs she has in hand and we do not tell her ours for she knows nothing of this drowning job that is to come off directly be easy mother wolves don't eat each other and this will be a good day's work and when i recollect too that the jewel matcher has often about her twenty to thirty thousand francs worth of diamonds in her bag and that in less than two hours we shall have her in bras rouge's cellar thirty thousand francs worth of diamonds mother think of that and whilst we lay hands on this woman bras rouge is to remain outside the cabaret inquired the widow with an air of suspicion well and where would you have him i should like to know if any one comes to his house mustn't he be outside the door to answer them and prevent them from entering the place whilst we are doing our job nicolas nicolas cried calabash at this moment from outside here come the two women quick quick mother your shawl i will land you on the other side and that will be so much done said nicolas the widow had replaced her morning headdress with a high black cap in which she now made her appearance at the instigation of nicolas she wrapped herself in a large plaid shawl with grey and white checks and after having carefully closed and secured the kitchen door she placed the key behind one of the window shutters on the ground floor and followed her son who was hastily pursuing his way to the landing-place almost involuntarily as she quitted the island she cast a long and meditative look at martial's window and the train of thought to which its firmly nailed and iron-bound exterior gave rise seemed to judge by their effect to be of a very mingled and complicated character 
for she knitted her brows pursed her lips and then after a sudden convulsive shudder she murmured in a low hesitating voice it is his own fault it is his own fault nicolas do you see them just down there along the path a country girl and an old woman exclaimed calabash pointing to the other side of the river where madame seraphin and fleur de marie were descending a narrow winding path which passed by a high bank on the top of which were the lime kilns let us wait for the signal don't let us spoil the job by too much haste said nicolas what are you blind don't you recognize the stout woman who came the day before yesterday look at her orange shawl and the little country girl what a hurry she seems in she's a good little thing i know and it's plain she has no idea of what is going to happen to her or she wouldn't hasten on that pace i'm thinking yes i recollect the stout woman now it's all right then all right although they are so much behind the time i had almost given up the job as bad but let us quite understand the thing calabash i shall take the old woman and the young girl in the boat with a valve to it you will follow me close on stern to stern and mind and row steadily so that with one spring i may jump from one boat to the other as soon as i have opened the pipe and the water begins to sink the boat don't be afraid about me it is not the first time i have pulled a boat is it i am not afraid of being drowned you know i can swim but if i did not jump well into the other boat why the women in their struggles against drowning might catch hold of me and much obliged to you but i have no fancy for a bath with the two ladies the old woman waves her handkerchief said calabash there they are on the bank come come along mother let's push off said nicolas unmooring come you into the boat with the valve then the two women will not have any fear and you calabash jump into t'other and use your arms my girl and pull a good one ah by the way take the boat-hook and put it beside you it is as sharp as a lance and it may be useful added the ruffian as he placed beside calabash in the boat a long hook with a sharp iron point a few moments and the two boats one rowed by nicolas and the other by calabash reached the shore where for some moments madame seraphin and fleur de marie had been waiting whilst nicolas was fastening his boat to a post on the bank madame seraphin approached him and said in a low and rapid tone say that madame georges is waiting for us at the island you understand and then in a louder voice she added we are rather late my lad yes my good lady madame georges has been asking for you several times you see my dear young lady madame georges is waiting for us said madame seraphin turning to fleur de marie who in spite of her confidence had felt considerable repugnance at the sight of the sinister countenances of calabash nicolas and the widow but the mention of madame georges reassured her and she replied i am just as impatient to see madame georges fortunately it is not a long way across how delighted the dear lady will be said madame seraphin then addressing nicolas now then my lad bring your boat a little closer that we may get in adding in an undertone the girl must be drowned mind if she comes up thrust her back again into the water all right ma'am and don't be alarmed yourself but when i make you the signal give me your hand she'll then pass under all alone for everything's ready and you have nothing to fear replied nicolas in a similar tone and then with savage brutality unmoved by fleur de marie's youth and beauty he put his hand out to her the young girl leaned lightly on him and entered the boat now you my good lady said nicolas to madame seraphin offering her his hand in turn was it presentiment or mistrust or only fear that she could not spring quickly enough out of the little bark in which nicolas and the goualeuse were that made jacques ferrand's housekeeper say to nicolas shrinking back no i'll go in the boat with mademoiselle and she took her seat by calabash just as you please said nicolas exchanging an expressive look with his sister as with a vigorous thrust with his oar he drove his boat from the bank his sister did the same directly madame seraphin was seated beside her standing looking fixedly on the bank indifferent to the scene the widow pensive and absorbed fixed her look obstinately on martial's window which was discernible from the landing-place through the poplars during this time the two boats in the first of which were nicolas and fleur de marie and in the other calabash and madame seraphin left the bank slowly End of chapter fifteen read by celine major
Chapter Sixteen of the Mysteries of Paris, Volume Four by Eugène Sue. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Happiness of Meeting. Before the reader is made acquainted with the denouement of the drama then passing in Nicolas's boat, we shall beg leave to retrace our steps. Shortly after Fleur de Marie had quitted Saint Lazare in company of Madame Seraphin, La Louve also left that prison thanks to the recommendations of madame armand and the governor who were desirous of recompensing her for her kindness towards mont saint jean the few remaining days the beloved of martial had still to remain in confinement were remitted her a complete change had come over this hitherto depraved degraded and intractable being forever brooding over the description of the peaceful wild and retired life so beautifully depictured by fleur de marie la louve entertained the utmost horror and disgust of her past life to bury herself with martial in the deep shades of some vast forest such was her waking and dreaming thought the one fixed idea of her existence against which all her former evil inclinations had in vain struggled when separating herself from la goualeuse whose growing influence she feared this singular creature had retired to another part of st lazare to complete this sincere though rapid conversion still more assured by the ineffectual resistance attempted by the perverse and forward habits of her companion fleur de marie following the dictates of her own natural good sense had thus reasoned la louve a violent and determined creature is passionately fond of martial she would then hail with delight the means of quitting the disgraceful life she now for the first time views with shame and disgust for the purpose of entirely devoting herself to the rude unpolished man whose taste she so entirely partakes of and who seeks to hide himself from the world as much from inclination as from a desire of escaping from the universal reprobation in which his family is viewed assisted by these small materials gleaned during her conversation with la louve fleur de marie in giving a right direction to the unbridled passion and restraining the daring hardihood of the reckless creature had positively converted a lost wretched being into an honest woman for what could the most virtuous of her sex have desired more than to bestow her undivided affections on the man of her choice to dwell with him in the silence and solitude of woods where hard labour privations and poverty would all be cheerfully borne and shared for his dear sake to whom her heart was given and such was the constant ardent prayer of la louve relying on the assistance which fleur de marie had assured her of in the name of an unknown benefactor la louve determined to make her praiseworthy proposal to her lover not indeed without the keen and bitter apprehension of being rejected by him for la goualeuse while she brought her to blush for her past life awakened her to a just sense also of her position as regarded martial once at liberty la louve thought only of seeing her man as she called him he took exclusive possession of her mind she had heard nothing of him for several days in the hopes of meeting him in the ile du ravageur and with the determination of waiting there until he came should she fail to find him at first she paid the driver of a cabriolet liberally to conduct her with all speed to the bridge of asnières which she crossed about a quarter of an hour before madame seraphin and fleur de marie they having walked from the barrier had reached the banks of the river near the lime kilns as martial did not present himself to ferry la louve across to the ile du ravageur she applied to an old fisherman named father Ferraud, who lived close by the bridge it was about four o'clock in the day when a cabriolet stopped at the entrance of a small street in the village of asnières la louve leaped from it at one bound threw a five-franc piece to the driver and proceeded with all haste to the dwelling of old ferraud the ferryman la louve no longer dressed in her prison garb wore a gown of dark green merino a red imitation of cashmere shawl with large flaming pattern and a net cap trimmed with riband her thick curly hair was scarcely smoothed out her impatient longing to see martial having rendered an ordinary attention to her toilette quite impossible any other female would after so long a separation have exerted her very utmost to appear becomingly adorned at her first interview with her lover but la louve knew little and cared less for all these coquettish arts which ill accorded with her excitable nature her first her predominating desire was to see her man as quickly as possible and this impetuous wish was caused not alone by the fervour of a love which in minds as wild and unregulated as hers sometimes leads on to madness but also from a yearning to pour into the ear of martial the virtuous resolutions she had formed 
and to reveal to him the bright vista of happiness opened to both by her conversation with fleur de marie the flying steps of la louve soon conducted her to the fisherman's cottage and there seated tranquilly before the door she found father ferrot an old white-headed man busily employed mending his nets even before she came close up to him la louve cried out quick quick father ferrot your boat your boat what is it you my girl well how are you i have not seen you this long while i know i know but where is your boat and take me across to the isle as fast as you can row my boat well to be sure now how very unlucky as if it was to be so bless you my girl it is quite out of my power to ferry you across to-day but why why is it why you see my son has taken my boat to go up to the boat races held at st ouen bless your heart i don't think there's a boat left all along the river's side distraction exclaimed la louve stamping her foot and clenching her hand then all is lost i shall not be able to see him upon my honour and word it's true though said old ferrot i am extremely sorry i am unable to ferry you over because no doubt by your going on so he is very much worse who is much worse who why martial martial exclaimed la louve snatching the sleeve of the old ferrot's jacket my man ill bless me did you not know it martial do you mean martial to be sure i do but don't hold me so tight you'll tear my blouse now be quiet there's a good girl i declare you frighten me you stare about so wildly ill martial ill how long has he been so oh two or three days tis false he would have written and told me of it had it been so ah uh, but then don't you see he's been too bad to handle a pen too ill to write and he is on the isle are you quite sure quite sure he is there why i'll tell you you must know this morning i meets the widow martial now you are aware my girl that most in general when i notice her coming one way i make it my business to go to the other for i am not particular fond of her i can't say i am so then but my man my man tell me of him wait a bit i'm coming to him so when i found i couldn't get away from the mother and to speak the honest truth that woman makes me afraid to seem to slight her she has a sort of an evil look about her like one as could do you any manner of harm for only wishing for i can't account for it i don't know what it is for i'm not timorous by nature but somehow the widow martial does downright scare me well says i thinking just to say a few words and pass on i haven't seen anything of your son martial these last two or three days says i i suppose he's not with you just now upon which she fixed her eyes upon me with such a look tis well they were not pistols or they would have shot me as folks say you drive me wild and then what said she father ferrot was silent for a minute or two and then added come now you are a right sort of girl if you will only promise me to be secret i will tell you all i know concerning my man ay to be sure for martial is a good fellow though somewhat thoughtless and it would be a sore pity should any mischance befall him through that old wretch of a mother or his rascally brother but what is going on what have his mother or brother done and where is he eh speak i tell you speak well well have a little patience and i say do just let my blouse alone come take your hands off there's a good girl if you keep interrupting me and tear my clothes in this way i shall never be able to finish my story and you will know nothing at last oh how you try my patience exclaimed la louve stamping her foot with intense passion and you promise never to repeat a word of what i am about to tell you no no i never will upon your word of honour father ferrot you will drive me mad oh what a hot-headed girl it is well now then this is what i have got to say but first and foremost 
i must tell you that martial is more than ever at variance with his family and if he were to get some foul play at their hands i should not be at all surprised and that makes me the more sorry my boat is not at hand to help you across the water for if you reckon upon either nicolas or calabash taking you over to the isle while you'll just find yourself disappointed that's all i know that as well as you do but what did my man's mother tell you he was in the isle then when he fell ill was he not don't you put me out so with your questions let me tell my story my own way this morning i says to the widow why says i i have seen nothing of martial these last two or three days i mark his boat is still moored he don't seem to use it as usual i suppose he's gone away a bit maybe he's in paris upon business upon which the widow gave me oh such a devil's look so says she he's bad a bed in the isle and we don't look for him to get better oh oh says i to myself that's it is it it's three days since hola stop i say cried old ferraud interrupting himself where the deuce are you going what is the girl after now believing the life of martial in danger from the inhabitants of the isle and unable longer to endure the twaddle of the old fisherman la louve rushed half frantic with rage and fear towards the banks of the seine some topographical descriptions will be requisite for the perfect understanding of this ensuing scene the île du ravageur was nearer to the left bank of the river than it was to the right from which fleur de marie and madame seraphin had embarked la louve stood on the left bank without being extremely high the surface of the isle completely prevented those on one side the river from seeing what was passing on the opposite bank thus la louve had been unable to witness the embarkation of la goualeuse while the martial family had been equally prevented from seeing la louve who at that very instant was rushing in wild desperation along the banks of the other side of the river let us also recall to the reader that the country house belonging to dr griffon and temporarily occupied by the count saint remy was midway between the land and that part of the shore where la louve arrived half wild with apprehension and impatience unconsciously she rushed past two individuals who struck with her excited manner and haggard looks turned back to watch her proceedings these two personages were the count saint remy and dr griffon the first impulse of la louve upon learning the danger which threatened her lover was to hurry towards the spot from whence the peril proceeded but as she reached the water's edge she became painfully sensible of the difficulties that stood in the way of her reaching the opposite land as the old fisherman had assured her she well knew the folly of expecting any strangers to pass by and none of the martial family would take the trouble of rowing over to fetch her to the isle heated and breathless her eyes sparkling with eager excitement she stopped opposite that point of the isle which taking a sudden bend in this direction was the nearest approach from the shore through the leafless branches of the willows and poplars la louve could see the roof of the very house where martial perhaps lay dying at this distracting idea la louve uttered a wild cry of desperation then snatching off her shawl and cap she slipped out of her gown and undressed as she was to her petticoat she threw herself intrepidly into the river waited until she got out of her depth and then fearlessly striking out she swam determinedly towards the isle affording a strange spectacle of wild and desperate energy at each fresh impulsion of the arms the long thick hair of la louve unfastened by the violent exercise she was using shook and waved about her head like the rich mane of a war-horse but for the fixedness of her gaze constantly riveted on the house which contained martial and the contraction of her features drawn together by almost the convulsive agonies of fear and dreadful anticipation of arriving too late the poacher's mistress might have been supposed to have been merely enjoying the cool refreshment of the water for her own sport and diversion so boldly and freely did she swim tattooed in remembrance of her lover her white but sinewy arms strong as those of a man divided the waters with a stroke which sent the sparkling element in rushing streams of liquid pearls over her broad shoulders and strong expansive chest resembling a block of half-submerged marble all at once from the other side of the isle rose a cry of distress a cry of agony at once fearful and despairing la louve started and suddenly stopped in her rapid course 
then supporting herself with one hand with the other she pushed back her thick dripping hair and listened again the cry was repeated but more feebly supplicatory convulsive and expiring and the most profound silence reigned around tis martial tis his cry he calls me to his aid exclaimed la louve swimming with renewed vigour for in her excited state of mind the voice which had rent the air and sent a pang through her whole frame seemed to her to be that of her lover the count and the doctor whom la louve had rushed so quickly by were quite unable to overtake her in time to prevent her daring attempt but both arrived immediately opposite the isle at the moment when those frightful cries were heard both stopped as perfectly shocked and startled as la louve had been observing the desperate energy with which she battled with the water they exclaimed the unfortunate creature means to drown herself but their fears were in vain martial's mistress swam like an otter and with a few more vigorous strokes the intrepid creature had reached the land she gained her feet and to assist her in climbing up the bank she took hold of one of the stakes used as a sort of protecting stockade at the extremity of the isle when at that instant as partially in the water and holding on by one hand she saw drifting along the form of a young female dressed after the fashion of the country girls who come to paris with their wares the body floated slowly on with the current which drove it against the piles while the garment served to render it buoyant to cling to one of the strongest stakes and with the hand left free to snatch at the clothes of the female as it was passing was the instantaneous impulse of la louve an impulse executed as rapidly as conceived in her extreme eagerness however she drew the unfortunate being she sought to save so suddenly and violently towards her and within the small enclosure formed by the piles that the body sunk completely under water though here it was shallow enough to walk to land gifted with skill and strength far from common la louve raised la goualeuse for she it was although not as yet recognized by her late friend took her up in her powerful arms as though she had been a child and laid her on the grassy banks of the isle courage courage shouted m saint-remy from the opposite side having as well as dr griffon witnessed this bold deliverance we will make all haste to cross the bridge of asnières and bring a boat to your assistance after thus speaking both the count and his companion proceeded as quickly as they were able in the direction of the bridge but la louve heard not the words addressed to her let us again repeat that from the right bank of the seine on which nicolas calabash and their mother assembled after the commission of their atrocious crime it was impossible owing to its steepness to observe what was passing on the opposite shore fleur de marie abruptly drawn by la louve within the piles having first sunk completely from the eyes of her murderers was thus in safety from any further pursuit on their part they believing that she had effectually perished a few instants after the current as it swept by carried with it a second body floating near the surface of the water but la louve perceived it not it was the corpse of madame seraphin the notary's femme de charge she however was perfectly dead it was as much the interest of nicolas and calabash as it was of jacques ferrand to remove so formidable a witness as well as sharer of their crime seizing the opportunity therefore when the boat sunk with fleur de marie to spring into that rowed by his sister and in which madame seraphin he contrived to give the small vessel so great a shock as almost threw the femme de charge into the water and while struggling to recover herself he managed to thrust her overboard and then to finish her with his boat-hook breathless and exhausted la louve kneeling on the grass beside fleur de marie tried to recover her strength and at the same time to make out the features of her she had saved from certain death who can describe her surprise her utter astonishment as she recognized her late prison companion she who had exercised so beneficial an influence on her mind and produced so complete a change in her conduct and ideas in the first bewilderment of her feelings even martial was forgotten la goualeuse exclaimed she as with head bent down her hair dishevelled her garments streaming with wet she kneeling contemplated the unhappy girl stretched almost dying before her on the grass pale motionless her half-closed eyes vacant and senseless her beautiful hair glued to her pallid brows her lips blue and livid her small delicate hands stiff and cold la goualeuse might well have passed for dead to any but the watchful eye of affection la goualeuse again cried la louve 
what a singular chance that i should have come hither to relate to my man all the good and harm she has done me with her words and promises as well as the resolution i have taken and to find the poor thing thus to give me the meeting poor girl she is cold and dead but no no exclaimed la louve stooping still more closely over fleur de marie and as she did so finding a faint indeed almost imperceptible breath escape her lips no she lives merciful father she breathes and tis i have snatched her from death i who never yet saved any one oh how happy the thought makes me my heart glows with a new delight how thankful i feel that none but i saved her ha but my man i must save him also perhaps he is even now in his death throes his mother and brother are even wretches enough to murder him what shall i do i cannot leave this poor creature here i will carry her to the widow's house she must and she shall succour the poor goualeuse and let me see martial or i will smash everything in my way no mother brother or sister shall hinder me from going wherever my man is and springing up as she spoke la louve raised fleur de marie in her strong arms charged with this slender burthen she hurried towards the house never for a moment doubting that in spite of their hard and wicked natures the widow and her daughter would bestow on fleur de marie every requisite care when martial's mistress had reached that point of the isle from which both sides of the seine were distinguishable nicolas his mother and calabash had quitted the place certain of the accomplishment of their double crime they then repaired in all haste to the house of bras rouge at this moment a man who hidden in one of the recesses of the river concealed by the lime-kiln had without being seen himself witnessed the whole progress of this horrible scene also disappeared believing as well as the guilty perpetrators that the fell deed had been fully achieved this man was jacques ferrand one of nicolas's boats was rocking to and fro more to a stake on the river bank just where madame seraphin and la goualeuse had embarked scarcely had jacques ferrand quitted the lime-kiln to return to paris than monsieur de saint-remy and dr griffon hastily crossed the bridge of asnières for the purpose of reaching the isle which they contemplated doing by means of nicolas's boat which they had discerned from afar to the extreme astonishment of la louve when she arrived at the house in the île du ravageur she found the door shut and fastened placing the still inanimate form of fleur de marie beneath the porch she more closely examined the dwelling the window of martial's chamber was well known to her what was her surprise to find the shutters belonging to it closed and sheets of tin nailed over them strongly secured from without by two bars of iron suspecting a part of the cause of this la louve in a loud hoarse voice of mingled fury and deep tenderness screamed out as loudly as she could martial my man no answer was returned terrified at this silence la louve began pacing round and round the house like a wild beast who scents the spot whither her mate has been entrapped and with deep roars and savage growls demands admittance to him still pursuing her agitated search la louve kept shouting from time to time my man are you there my man and in her desperate fury she shook and rattled the bars of the kitchen windows beat against the walls and knocked long and loudly at the door all at once a dull indistinct noise was heard from within side the house eagerly and attentively la louve listened the noise however ceased my man heard me i must and will get in somehow if i gnaw the door away with my teeth and again she reiterated her frantic cries and adjurations to martial several faint blows struck inside the closed shutters of martial's chamber replied to the yells and screams of la louve he is there cried she suddenly stopping beneath the window of her lover he is there i am sure of it and if all other means fail i will strip off that tin with my nails but i will wrench those shutters open so saying she glanced frantically around in search of something to aid her efforts to free her lover when her eye caught sight of a ladder partly hanging against one of the outside shutters of the sitting-room hastily pulling the shutter the more quickly to disengage the ladder the key of the outer door left by the window on the sill of the window fell to the ground oh if this be only the right key cried la louve trying it in the lock of the entrance door i can go straight upstairs to his chamber oh it turns it opens exclaimed la louve with delight 
and my man is saved once in the kitchen she was struck by the cries of the two children who shut up in the cellar and hearing an unusual noise called loudly for help the widow persuaded that no person would visit the isle or her dwelling had contented herself with double locking the door upon francois and amandine leaving the key in the lock released by la louve the two children hurried from the cellar to the kitchen oh la louve exclaimed francois save our dear brother martial they want him to die for two days he has been shut up in his room they have not wounded him have they no no i think not i have arrived just in time it seems cried la louve rushing towards the staircase and hastily mounting the stairs then suddenly stopping she exclaimed ah but la goualeuse i quite forgot her amandine my child light a fire directly and then do you and your brother fetch a poor half-drowned girl you will find lying outside the door under the porch and place her before the fire she would have been quite dead if i had not saved her francois quick bring me a crowbar a hatchet an axe anything that i may break in the door that confines my man there is the cleaver we split wood with but it is too heavy for you said the lad dragging forward an enormous chopper too heavy i don't even feel it cried la louve swinging the ponderous weapon which at another time she would have had much difficulty in lifting as though it had been a feather then proceeding with hurried steps upstairs she called out to the children go and fetch the young girl i told you of and place her by the fire and with two bounds la louve reached the corridor at the end of which was situated the apartment of martial courage courage my man your louve is here cried she and lifting the cleaver with both hands she dashed it furiously against the door it is fastened on the outside moaned martial in a feeble voice draw out the nails you cannot open it otherwise throwing herself upon her knees in the passage by the help of the edge of the cleaver her nails which she almost tore bleeding from their roots and her fingers which were lacerated and torn la louve contrived to extract the huge nails which fastened the door all around at length her heroic exertions were crowned with success the door yielded to her efforts and martial pale bleeding and almost exhausted fell into the arms of his mistress at last i have you i hold you i press you to my heart exclaimed la louve as she received and tenderly pressed martial in her arms with a joy of possession that partook almost of savage energy she supported or rather carried him to a bench placed in the corridor for several minutes martial remained weak and haggard endeavouring to recover from the violent surprise which had proved nearly too much for his exhausted strength la louve had come to the succour of her lover at the very instant when worn out and despairing he felt himself dying less from want of food than air which it was impossible to obtain in so small an apartment unprovided with a chimney or any other outlet and hermetically closed thanks to the fiendish contrivance of calabash who had stopped even the most trifling crevices in the door and window with pieces of old rag trembling with joy and apprehension her eyes streaming with tears la louve kneeling beside martial watched his slightest movements and intently gazed on his features the unfortunate youth seemed gradually to recover as his lungs inhaled a freer and more healthful atmosphere after a few convulsive shudderings he raised his languid head heaved a deep sigh and opening his eyes looked eagerly around him martial tis i your louve how are you now better replied he in a feeble voice thank god would you have a little water or some vinegar no no replied martial speaking more naturally air air oh i want only air at the risk of gashing the backs of her hands la louve drove them through the four panes of a window she could not have opened without first removing a large and heavy table now i breathe i breathe freely and my head seems quite relieved said martial entirely recovering his senses and voice then as if recalling for the first time the service his mistress had rendered him he exclaimed with a burst of ineffable gratitude but for you my brave louve i should soon have been dead oh never mind thinking of that but tell me how do you find yourself now better much better you are hungry i doubt not no i feel myself too weak for that what i have suffered most cruelly from has been want of air at last i felt suffocating strangling choking 
oh it was dreadful but now i live again i come forth from the very tomb itself and that too thanks to you and these cuts upon your poor bleeding hands for god's sake what have they done to you nicolas and calabash not daring to attack me openly a second time fastened me up in my chamber to allow me to perish of hunger in it i tried to prevent their nailing up my shutters and my sister chopped my fingers with a hatchet the monsters they wished to make it appear that you had died of sickness your mother had spread the report of your being in a hopeless state your mother my man your own mother hold cried martial with bitterness mention her not then for the first time remarking the wet garments and singular state of la louve's attire he added but what has happened to you your hair is dripping wet you have only your underclothes on and they are drenched through no matter no matter what has happened to me since you are saved oh yes saved but explain to me how you became thus wet through i knew you were in danger and finding no boat you swam to my rescue i did but your hands give them to me that i may heal them with my kisses you are in pain i fear oh the monsters and i not here to help you oh my brave louve exclaimed martial enthusiastically bravest and best of all brave creatures did not your hand trace on my arm death to the cowardly see cried la louve showing her tattooed arm on which these very words were indelibly engraved yes you are bold and intrepid but the cold has seized you you tremble indeed it is not with cold never mind go in there you will find calabash's cloak wrap yourself well in it but i insist in an instant la louve who had quickly flown at her lover's second command returned wrapped in a plaid mantle to think you ran the risk of drowning yourself and all for me resumed martial gazing on her with enthusiastic delight oh no not altogether for you a poor girl was nearly perishing in the river and i saved her as i landed saved her also and where is she below with the children who are taking care of her and who is she oh dear you can scarcely credit what a singular and lucky chance brought me to her rescue she was one of my companions at st lazare a most extraordinary sort of girl and you don't half know how so only conceive by both hating and loving her for she had introduced happiness and death into my heart and thoughts who this girl yes and all on your account on mine hark ye martial then interrupting her proposed speech la louve continued no no i never never can what i had a request to make to you and for that purpose i came hither because when i quitted paris i knew nothing of your danger then speak pray do i dare not dare not after all you have done for me no for then it would appear as though i claimed a right to be rewarded a right to be rewarded and have you not already earned that right do i not already owe you much and did you not tend my sick bed with unfailing watchfulness both night and day during my illness of the past year are you not my man my own dear man and for the reason that i am and ever shall be your man are you not bound to speak openly and candidly to me for ever martial yes for ever as true as my name is martial i shall never care for any other woman in the world but you my brave louve never mind what you may have been or what you may have done that is nobody's affair but mine i love you and you love me and moreover i owe you my life but somehow do you know since you have been in prison i have not been like the same person all sorts of fresh thoughts have come into my mind i have thought it well over and i have resolved that you shall no more be what you have been what can you mean that i will never more quit you neither will i part from francois and amandine your young sister and brother yes from this day forward i must be as a second father to these poor children don't you see by imposing on myself fresh duties i am compelled to alter and amend what is amiss in my way of conducting myself but i consider it my positive task to take charge of these young things 
or they will be made artful thieves and the only way to save them is to take them from here where to that i know not but certainly far from paris and me you why of course you go with me with you exclaimed la louve with joyful surprise she could not credit the reality of such happiness and shall i never again be parted from you no my brave girl never you will help me to bring up my little sister and young brother i know your heart when i say to you i greatly wish my poor little amandine to grow up a virtuous and industrious woman just talk to her about it and show her what to do i am quite sure and certain that you will be to her all the best mother could be to her own child oh thanks martial thanks thanks we shall live like honest work people never fear but we shall find work for we will toil like slaves to content our employers but at least these children will not be depraved and degraded beings like their parents i shall not continually hear myself taunted with my father and brother's disgraceful end neither shall i go through streets where you are known but what is the matter what ails you oh martial i feel as though i should go mad mad for what for joy and why should you go mad with joy because because it is too much what i mean that what you propose is too great happiness for one like me to hope for oh indeed indeed it is more than i can bear but who knows perhaps saving la goualeuse has brought me good luck that's it i am sure and certain still i ask you what is the matter and why are you thus agitated exclaimed martial oh martial martial the very thing you have been proposing well i was going to ask you to quit paris yes replied she in a hurried tone and to try your consent to accompany you to the forest where we should have a nice neat little house and children whom i should love as la louve with the children of her man or if you would permit me continued la louve in a faltering voice instead of calling you my man to say my husband for added she confusedly and rapidly for without that change we should not obtain the place martial in his turn regarded la louve with deep astonishment unable to comprehend her meaning what place are you speaking of said he at length of that of gamekeeper that i should have yes and who would give it to me the protector of the young girl i saved they do not know me but i have told her all about you and she will recommend us to her protector and what have you told her about me oh martial can you not guess of what could i speak but of your goodness and my love for you my excellent louve and then you know being in prison together makes folks talk to each other and open their hearts in the way of confidence besides which there was something so gentle and engaging about this young creature that i could not help feeling drawn towards her even in spite of myself for i very quickly discovered she was a very different person to such as you and i have been used to and who is she i know not neither can i guess but certainly i never met with any one like her bless you she can read the very thoughts of your heart the same as if she were a fairy i merely told her of my love for you and she immediately interested herself in us she made me feel ashamed of my past life not by saying harsh and severe things you know very well that would not have done much good with me but by talking of the pleasures of a life passed in hard but peaceful labour tranquilly within the quiet shades of deep forests where you might be occupied according to your tastes and inclinations only instead of your being a poacher she made you a gamekeeper and in place of my being only your mistress she pictured me as your true and lawful wife and then we were to have fine healthy children who ran joyfully to meet you when you returned at night followed by your faithful dogs and carrying your gun on your shoulder then we all sat down so gay and happy to eat our supper beneath the cool shade of the large trees that overhung our cottage door while the fresh wind blew and the moon peeped at us from amongst the thick branches and the little ones prattled and you related to us all you had seen and done during the day while wandering in the forests until at last cheerful and contented we retired to rest to rise the following day and with light hearts to recommence our labours i cannot tell you how it was 
but i listened and listened to these delightful pictures till i quite believed in their reality i seemed bound by a spell when she spoke of happiness like this though i tried ever so much against it i always found it impossible to believe that it would surely come to pass oh but you have no idea how beautifully she described it all i fancied i saw it you our children our forest home i rubbed my eyes but it was ever before them although a waking dream ah yes said martial sighing that would indeed be a sweet and pleasant life without being bad at heart poor francois has been quite enough in the society of calabash and nicolas to make it far better he should dwell in the solitude of wood and forests rather than be exposed to the further contamination of great towns amandine would help you in your household duties and i should make a capital gamekeeper from the very fact of my having been a poacher of some notoriety i should have you for my housekeeper and companion my good louve and then as you know we should have our children also bless their little hearts i doubt not our having a fine flock about us and what more could we wish for or desire when once we got used to a forest life it would seem as though we had always lived there and fifty or a hundred years would glide away like a single day but you must not talk to me of such happiness it makes one so full of sadness and regrets that it cannot be realized no no don't let us ever mention it again because don't you see la louve it comes over one like i should soon work myself up to madness if i allowed my thoughts to dwell on it ah martial i let you go on because i thought i was quite as bad myself i said just those very words to la goualeuse did you really i did indeed for after listening to all these tales of enchantment i said to her what a pity la goualeuse that these castles in the air as you call them are not true and what do you think martial asked la louve her eyes flashing with joy what do you think she answered me i don't know why said she only let martial marry you and give me your promise to live honestly and virtuously henceforward and directly i quit the prison i will exert myself to get the place i have been speaking of for him get me a gamekeeper's place yes i declare to you martial she said so oh but as you say that can be but a dream a mere fancy if indeed nothing were requisite for our obtaining the place but our being married my good girl that should be done to-morrow if i had the means though from this very day and hour i consider you as my true and lawful wife oh martial i your lawful wife the only woman who shall ever bear that title and for the future i wish you to call me husband for such i am in word and heart as firmly and lastingly as though we had been before the mer oh la goualeuse was right a woman feels so proud and happy to say my husband oh martial you shall see what a good faithful devoted wife i will be to you how hard i will work oh i shall be so delighted to labour for you and do you really think there is any chance of our getting this place if the poor dear goualeuse deceives herself about it it is that others deceive her for she seemed quite sure of being able to fulfil her promise and besides when i was quitting the prison a little while ago the inspectress told me that the protectors of la goualeuse who were people of rank and consequence had removed her from confinement that very day now that proved her having powerful friends so that she can keep her word to us if she likes but cried martial suddenly rising i don't know what we have been thinking of all this time thinking about what do you mean martial why the poor girl you saved from drowning is downstairs perhaps dying and instead of rendering her any assistance we are attending to our own affairs upstairs make yourself perfectly easy francois and amandine are there watching her and they would have come to call us had there been any danger or necessity still you are right let us go to her you must see her to whom we shall perhaps owe all our future happiness and martial supported by la louve descended to the lower part of the house before they have reached the kitchen let us in a few words describe what had occurred there from the time when fleur de marie had been confided to the charge of the two children end of chapter sixteen read by celine major
Chapter Seventeen of the Mysteries of Paris, Volume Four, by Eugène Sue. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Doctor Griffon. François and Amandine had contrived to convey Fleur de Marie near the fire when Monsieur de Saint Remy and Doctor Griffon, who had crossed the river in Nicolas' boat, entered the house. Whilst the children were making the fire burn up, Doctor Griffon bestowed on the young girl his utmost care the poor girl cannot be more than seventeen at most exclaimed the count who was looking on what do you think of her doctor her pulse is scarcely perceptible but strange to say the skin of the face is not livid in the subject as is usually the case in asphyxia from submersion replied the doctor with professional calmness and contemplating fleur de marie with a deeply meditative air dr griffon was a tall thin man pallid and completely bald except two tufts of thin black hair carefully brushed back on the pole and flattened on the temples his countenance wrinkled and furrowed by the fatigues of study was calm intelligent and reflective profoundly learned of great experience and a skilful practitioner first surgeon at a civil hospital where we shall again encounter him dr griffon had but one defect that of completely abstracting himself from the patient and only considering the disease young or old rich or poor was no matter he only thought of medical fact more or less remarkable which the subject presented for him there was nothing but subjects what a lovely face how beautiful she is in spite of this frightful paleness said m de Saint-Rémy. did you ever see milder or more expressive features my dear doctor and so young so young age is no consequence said the doctor abruptly no more than the presence of water in the lungs which was formerly thought fatal it was a gross error which the admirable experiments of goodwin the famous goodwin incontestably detected and exposed but doctor but it is a fact replied m griffon absorbed by the love of his art to detect the presence of any foreign liquid in the lungs goodwin plunged some cats and dogs several times into tubs filled with ink for some seconds taking them out alive and then after a time dissected the animals well he was convinced from the dissection that the ink had penetrated the lungs and that the presence of this liquid in the respiratory organs had not caused the death of the subject the count knew the doctor was a worthy creature at heart but that his mad passion for science made him often appear harsh and cruel have you any hope inquired m de saint-remy impatiently the extremities of the subject are very cold said the doctor there is but very slight hope ah poor child to die at that age is indeed a terrible pupil fixed dilated observed the doctor impassive and pushing up the frigid eyelid of fleur de marie with his forefinger what a singular man exclaimed the comte almost with indignation one would suppose you pitiless and yet i have seen you watch by my bedside for nights together had i been your brother you could not have been more generously devoted to me dr griffon still occupied in doing all that was requisite and possible for fleur de marie replied to the comte without looking at him and with imperturbable phlegm parbleu do you think one meets with an intermittent fever so wonderfully complicated as that you had it was wonderful my dear friend astonishing stupor delirium muscular action of the tendons syncopes that important fever combined the most varied symptoms you were indeed affected by a partial and momentary attack of paralysis and if it had presented nothing else why your attack was entitled to all the attention in my power you presented a magnificent study and truth to say my dear friend what i desire most in the world is to meet with such another glorious fever but that is a piece of good fortune that never occurs twice at this moment martial descended leaning on the arm of la louve who still retained over her wet clothes the plaid cloak which belonged to calabash struck with the paleness of martial and remarking his hands covered with dried blood the comte exclaimed who is this man my husband replied la louve looking at martial with an expression of happiness and noble pride impossible to describe you have a good and intrepid wife sir said the comte to him 
i saw her save this unfortunate young girl with singular courage yes sir my wife is good and intrepid replied martial with emphasis and regarding la louve with an air at once full of love and tenderness yes intrepid for she has also come in time to save my life your life exclaimed the comte look at his hands his poor hands said la louve wiping away the tears which softened the wild brightness of her eyes horrible cried the comte see doctor how his hands are hacked dr griffon turning his head slightly and looking over his shoulder at martial's hands said to him open and shut your hand martial did so with considerable pain the doctor shrugged his shoulders and continued his attentions to fleur de marie saying merely and as if with regret there is nothing serious in those cuts there's no tendon injured in a week the subject will be able to use his hands again then sir my husband will not be crippled said la louve with gratitude the doctor shook his head affirmatively and la goualeuse will recover won't she sir inquired la louve oh she must live for i and my husband owe her so much then turning towards martial poor dear girl there she is as i told you she who will perhaps be the cause of our happiness for it was she who gave me the idea of coming and saying to you all i have said what a chance that i should save her and here too she is a providence said martial struck by the beauty of la goualeuse what an angel's face oh she will recover will she not doctor i cannot say replied the doctor but in the first place can she remain here will she have all necessary attention here cried la louve why they commit murder here silence silence said martial the comte and the doctor looked at la louve with surprise this house in the isle has a bad reputation hereabouts and i am not astonished at it observed the doctor in a low tone to m de saint-remy you have then been the victim of some violence observed the comte to martial how did you come by those wounds they are nothing nothing sir i had a quarrel a struggle ensued and i was wounded but this young peasant girl cannot remain in this house he added with a gloomy air i cannot remain here myself nor my wife nor my brother nor my sister whom you see we are going to leave the isle never to return to it oh how nice exclaimed the two children then what are we to do said the doctor looking at fleur de marie it is impossible to think of conveying the subject to paris in her present state of prostration but then my house is quite close at hand my gardener's wife and her daughter are capital nurses and since the asphyxia by submersion interests you my dear saint remy why you can watch over the necessary attentions and i will come and see her every day and you assume the harsh and pitiless man exclaimed the comte when as your proposal proves you have one of the noblest hearts in the world if the subject sinks under it as is possible there will be an opportunity for a most interesting dissection which will allow me to confirm once again goodwin's assertions how horridly you talk cried the comte for those who know how to read the dead body is a book in which they learn to save the lives of the diseased replied dr griffon stoically at last then you do good said m de saint-remy with bitterness and that is important what consequence is the cause provided that benefit results poor child the more i look at her the more she interests me and well does she deserve it i can tell you sir observed la louve with excitement and approaching him do you know her inquired the comte do i know her sir why it is to her i owe the happiness of my life and i have not done for her half of what she has done for me and la louve looked passionately towards her husband she no longer called him her man and who is she asked m de saint-remy an angel sir all that is good in this world yes and although she is dressed as a country girl there is no merchant's wife no great lady who can discourse as well as she can with her sweet little voice just like music she is a noble girl i say full of courage and goodness by what accident did she fall into the water i do not know sir then she is not a peasant girl asked the comte a peasant girl look at her small white hand sir true 
observed m de saint-remy what a strange mystery but her name her family come along said the doctor breaking into the conversation we must convey the subject into the boat half an hour after this fleur de marie who had not yet recovered her senses was in the doctor's abode lying in a good bed and maternally watched by m griffon's gardener's wife to whom was added la louve the doctor promised m de saint-remy who was more and more interested in la goualeuse to return to see her again in the evening martial went to paris with francois and amandine la louve being unwilling to quit fleur de marie before she had been pronounced out of danger the ile du ravageur remained deserted we shall presently find its sinister inhabitants at bras rouge's where they were to be joined by the chouette for the murder of the diamond matcher in the meantime we will conduct the reader to the rendezvous which tom sarah's brother had with the horrible hag the schoolmaster's accomplice End of chapter seventeen read by Celine Major.